<laughs> okay, so we're now entering the part of our meeting where we are going to share our assignment. And I'm sure each of us have come up with a different aspect. Um, <laughs> so the the su subject was an event or situation that affected our, our family's lives. And um, Susan, I know you are dying to share yours. So I have two, you but I, I'll do one that's spookier. And then if there's time or maybe for the next week, I have something that really changed our family's lives. It's kind of more, one's like about 10 minutes. One's about, I don't know, 15 minutes, something like that. So I'll do the shorter one. All right. Okay. Okay. Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let me pull up the, I made a PowerPoint of this last night. It was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. So let's get this. So I'm going to tell you a story. I'm not going after her. I didn't make a PowerPoint. Well, I just was kind of goofing around. It's it's not anything fancy. So so don't get all where it's don't worry. Oh wait, I don't like it that it opens up this way. I want to just open up one. I you know what I learned is I learned that there's a lot of PowerPoint out there and you can play around with it. There's a lot going on. Okay, so let me move this over to the screen and make it at large. All right. I need to find you guys again. Having more screens doesn't necessarily make it easier to find people on screens. Okay, so these are my family members. This is Lucy Dennis Dale. Dennis was her maiden name. And James Knox Polk Dale. There was a lot of, of these uh, family names that were named after after like uh, presidents. presidents and stuff. Yeah, that was a lot in our, our family. So these are two different photos. Now these people are actually in their early thirties, but the mm. terror of what's about to be happened to them. Her stop, stop. Is <laughs> the lady on the left is in her thirties. <laughs> what did you say? Whoa, spooky. I, I didn't hear it's in the 1930s or they're in their 30s. They're in their 30s. It's so spooky. It's spooky. She's the not. story I'm going to tell you is so scary of what happened. To, no, it's it's not true. These oh. are taken later in life. But I thought it'd make it kind of oh. it's Halloween. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this is Jackson County, Arkansas. And I figured out this story, oh, I don't know, a long time ago when I was doing my genealogy, putting it in, and you're trying to get it together. And all of a sudden, you start noticing this pattern. You say to yourself, what the heck? <coughs> and this is just uh, what I was told is that where these people lived in Jackson County, Arkansas, and I don't know this for a fact, it's kind of the, uh, if you're looking at Arkansas, it's, it's, it's up in the upper right-hand side. Of, of Arkansas. It's northern east, kind of. My family later on moves to the middle, but north. It's almost to Missouri. So it's very, it's moved over a lot. Anyway, I was told that where they were from, it was lowlands and there was a lot of problems of um, diseases and things like that because of the water. It would, I guess, it breed mosquitoes oh, right. and stuff like that. So it was a really a big problem down, down there as far as illness. So this is not my family, but this is a picture I found and I thought it would probably approximate what this is like where they were living at the time. So keep that in mind. You know, this is back in the time when the world was black and white. So this is my, this is Emma America Dale. She's one of my aunts, great aunts, but, um, I don't have pictures of anybody else. So this is the oldest daughter of Lucy and um, James that I showed you earlier. So I'm going to pretend that this is Lucy because the story I'm telling is from 1878. So just picture this is probably what Lucy looked like at the time the story is happening because okay. this is her oldest daughter, her oldest child, actually. So Lucy and James have four kids they have emma america that's who you're looking at right now who is nine not in the time the picture is taken but 
when this happened in 1879, 1878. Emma America, and then Ella Cleora, who was seven, and then Maud Catherine, who was five, and James Franklin, three. So this is a family of six living in this little farmhouse somewhere in Franklin County, Arkansas. So what happens to this family who's living there? In June of 1878 is... This is, this is supposed to be yellow fever is kind of like what is what I was called. Now there's, I can't tell because there's no real death certificates or anything like that, but I think this is what killed him is yellow fever. And that's supposed to be a temperature on the side. So it was June of 1878. Imagine this family. And on June 6, 1878. Oh, I have notes. On June 6, 1878, Maude, who was five and Ella, who was seven died. Of this on the illness. same day on the same day they died so they oh. died from whatever this fever illness was and then on the oh, 16th really. of uh, 16th of june james the three-year-old dies so three children are dead within what two weeks of each other so here is here's what's left so here's lucy and her husband 1878 emma america is nine and she's the only one that's left they're all everybody else has died of this fever is lucy pregnant and on july 12th just a few weeks later what happens is something amazing she has a baby boy <laughs> yeah lucy was pregnant so she had another child named robert van buren get the name of the presidents again so a baby boy was born to this household after having the uh all of uh, three of the kids die so there was a baby boy. So there's this sickness in the household while the mother's pregnant. Yeah. So she's eight months pregnant, probably as she's bearing three children. Can you imagine mm -hmm. just the stress? So here, that's why I was saying that I was joking, saying that's what made him look like this yeah. stress. Yeah. Yeah. But um, they, they ended up having, um, they ended up having two more children after that. One of them is my grandfather and his name is uh, uh, John Dale. So this is my great grandparents because oh. my they eventually have my son my they have robert van buren then they have john and then they have another daughter named myrtle and so the husband james here on this on the right he ends up dying when he's 43 so i guess that's he's probably just under 43 in that picture and they were married 19 years oh. and then um, Emma America that's the oldest child remember I was saying mm -hmm. she lived through all this stress she got married about 10 years later and she died at 29 oh. I don't know what from she had one child and that child check out this child's name Columbus Burley and last name is Wood Columbus Burley Wood Columbus Wood <laughs> so Emma America had Columbus that yeah. it was a family thing yeah yeah family thing so my i thought that what probably happened was robert van buren that's the little baby who this little baby who was born in in the stress of all the other children dying he probably was really spoiled just like spoiled rotten because you know here here all this death 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 and then here comes this new child and so he didn't end up marrying nothing um, I can't find much about him except that he died at the age of 26. So he didn't make it very long himself. Jeez. Oh. So um, Lucy here on the left, she ends up living to be 76 years old. That's Thank right you. when this picture is taken. And she ends up having six children, but she outlives four of them. And that was my story. That's it. It was supposed to be a spooky, the spooky story because it was about woo, spooky. We don't have any ghosts or anything like stories or anything like that. Nothing, nothing fun like that. But I was just very stressful. Can you imagine having that dealing with that? But I guess it's just the way of life. I mean, as sad as it is to lose a baby or, or a child. So does the eight? I forgot. Does the 1880 census ask how many children and how many still living? No, it's 1900 and 1910. Oh. Yeah, she dies. Lucy, she. 
Well, I don't know, but it was just one of those stories that I accidentally picked up. You're just kind of looking through your ancestry and you're like, well, wait a minute. Why are these all have the same death date or almost the same death date? And I asked my aunt, thankfully, I still have this aunt that I can ask. And she said that um, it was some low fever in this area where they were living. And I think that's part of the reason why they moved out of that area because oh, yeah. it was a lot of sickness and stuff that. there too. So you she saw how that. swampy it was. There was a river, then there was that big pool of standing water. And yeah. I just yeah. never think of, of yellow fever as being a North American thing, but it certainly could it be. It might not have been. It's yeah. just, that's what they called it. It's Better some kind color of or something, fever. yeah. Something it must have like affected that. their liver or something to make them yellow. And they don't even have death certificates. So I don't know how, I don't know how we know they died because I can't find the death certificates. It was 18. Is there no, are there no newspapers back then that talked about? Uh, uh, That's a good labor. question. That's something I'm going to, I am going to look into because mm -hmm. there's got to be something maybe, but these are little rural com uh, um, cities or villages or right. whatever. But if there was some kind of, plague or Out, epidem epidemic or anything like that so columbus like ends up making it just he makes it to 1971 in texas which is kind of Whoa. weird think of 71 yeah i can remember 70s but yeah. he has a ton of kids so there's a lot of uh offspring so so james and lucy they had you know my grandfather and he had a hell of a lot of kids and a lot of grandkids and so so from these two people there was a off even though she lost three kids you know they wow. and and columbus dies not columbus robert van buren dies young and emma only has one child there still was an awful lot of offspring yeah in this yeah family. so not really spooky but it's as close as i could get you guys <laughs> that's good yeah okay. i think i'm gonna close my window i think this i don't know should i no there he is he's still there I'm going to turn off the screen so I don't have to, I'm going to try to get him out again, but whoever's next, I'm right here. Okay. Who wants to go next? <laughs> Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> I'm thinking of a, I'm thinking of a number between one and 20. And. <laughs> Wait, I have to think of the number first. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Is it I, got I got the number. Okay. I, I didn't hear what you all said. What'd you say? Six. You said six? Yes. Okay. What'd you say, Deirdre? Twelve. Okay. What'd you say, Tamberly? Uh Seven, but I got nothing. Well, the number was eight. So, Tamberly, you're the closest. Carolyn's yeah, got I, a I natural scary say. story with her mother. You yeah. knew I was going to say that, didn't you? If I can't top that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Other than the, my brother's telling me that dead bodies were buried in the little door inside my closet. <laughs> I told you that story. No, oh, tell us again. Oh, so we lived in the, our last house in Pennsylvania was this big old original farmhouse on the top of a hill. It was a really great funky house, but in my bedroom, there was like this little, like a little box thing that had a door in it. And so being the youngest and the only girl, my brothers told me that that's where they put the dead bodies, obviously in my bedroom. And so uh -huh. I used to, this, this is childhood reasoning. And I got really good at, it. I used to save shoe boxes and mm -hmm. um, collect air in them. <laughs> and again, I had older brothers. So I collected air in case they ever locked me in the closet with the dead bodies. I would have something to breathe and I wouldn't suffocate. Oh, and, I used to there and practice breathing the air out of the boxes. Oh, you got to take the shoe box. I got this on video. You've got to lift it really quickly and sniff and then close it or else all the air will come out and then hold your breath for a long time. And I would spend hours in there practicing breathing air so I didn't die in the closet and get drug under the house. What a genius of you. I'm going to use this story someday, somewhere, I'm going to tell the story again. That's what <laughs> happens when you have older brothers. No, older brothers should have filled the boxes with farts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell your father this? You'll oh, have a Lord. Halloween story. 
Have you told? Yeah, Deirdre said, "Have you told your father this?" Oh no. Well, yeah, that that one everyone knows. Oh. You know, this is a heavily science laden family, with the exception of this one. <laughs> so they're still in absolute uh, disbelief that anybody with that genetics could believe that you could. Hey. But it worked. I I didn't suffocate, so I have I have empirical proof. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm willing to believe it. I'm going to fill up some shoe boxes later today, it's, just in case. Leave them in strategic places. In I fact, when I got my birthday present from my brother this year, it had <laughs> some, you know, the little bags of the, you know, air in uh, packing stuff. Right. And my sister-in-law had gotten something from the UK, and he saved those packing things to put it in it. To oh, let me know no. he was also sending me some some British air that I could practice with. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, and I was 64 and I haven't gotten rid of that yet. <laughs> so I love but, it. You know, that's admirable because you were scared and you solved the problem. And you there is a survival it. instinct. Yeah. Yes, you have good survival instincts. That's well, this is the same. That house had a I guess like a mezzanine, you know, you go up the stairs. And then there's bedroom, bedroom. And so the whole stairwell is exposed with a banister all around it. Right. So they used to take me in my oldest brother's bedspread and hang me over the, told me, they claim they never actually did it, but tell me that I was hanging over the stairwell oh. and then let go and then catch it. But really it was probably over my brother's bed with somebody else catching it, but it used to absolutely terrify me. I, I would imagine. I'm not sure I would talk to my brothers after all. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more and more that maybe having siblings for children is probably not a great idea. <laughs> they ended up being really nice people, but yeah. <laughs> That's who? <laughs> you got a mouthy baby sister who will fall for anything, you know. I was raised very gullibly too. Very yeah. big gullible person. Who's huh. next? Good story, Tamberly. <laughs> and good story. Okay, Mary, Deirdre, which one? I really don't have anything. Neither did Tamberly. She just came up with something cute. Yeah, I just, I really, I really don't. I, I, I don't. No you were in the military. You must have a scary story. Oh, I don't. I really don't. The military. I don't. I have something that I have no, it's like the family story, even from this grandmother, that Susan will go, oh my God, but whatever. This is the grandmother that's not really my grandmother, it's my half brother's grandmother, but I was raised with her being my grandmother. And- um, Oh my God. She, oh, sorry, I'm a little yeah. early. No, she used to, um, my mother said, and she said, I forget what term they used, but she used to get uh, uncontrolled writings Oh, automatic writings. Yes. Oh, yeah. Where she would be sitting there and her hand would start going and somebody else's script mm -hmm. and words would come out. Very odd. I, I yeah, never. I, I, I've yes. grown up and I've gone like to different like parties and, you know, done like creepy stuff with like, you know, Ouija boards and stuff. Nothing creepy has ever happened to me. Well, you're not hanging out with the right friends then, Mary. This nothing to yeah, help nothing you really make it out. Other than my grandmother dying and that crow that was in the kitchen. He died and the morning that she died, my uncle was on his way to work and there was a big crow in the tree in front of her house. And then when I woke up, um, my aunt was screaming for me to come downstairs and I don't, we don't know how this crow got in the house because she died in December and it was really cold and every all the windows were pretty much painted shut. But this crow got in the kitchen and was flying from corner to corner. I got on my hands and knees and I opened up the door and it left. And later on that morning, <clears throat> I ran into a friend of my grandmother's up the street and I told her what happened. And she said that was all the evilness leaving my grandmother. Aww. She was like super, my grandmother was like super religious. Like they had, they, she died with her rosary beads that were literally, she prayed so much that they were worn down. Ooh. Like she was very like super religious and very, she would tell me stories all the time. Um, when she was in the hospital, 
when she broke her hip, she woke up and she said there was an angel standing over her bed. Mm. And like my grandmother, she was, she said she was crying and she was like, don't, you know, you're, she thought she was, the angel was coming for her. And like the angel didn't say anything, but then she went away. So, you mm. know, yeah. Just well, that weird, weird, weird. weird. Yeah. So, when and I was in, when I was in, go ahead. I have a, I have a, um, on my mom's side, a great uncle, he was actually miles away from the miracle of Fatima. He actually saw it. He saw the whole oh. sky wow. go crazy. And because uh, there were so many people that were going to that site that they were like in this jam, this traffic jam, they were walking to it and they, they saw it. So that's, huh. that's the weird stuff that happened. Well, Mary, you have a lot of stuff here. <laughs> I had that fainting. Have my I had a brother that died when I was in sixth grade, and I was remember I was a, singing in a Christmas concert for some all city chorus or something. You got out of school, and my mother at an old folks home. All these ancient people, and my mother, and my mother flat out faints during this choral thing with all these old people, big commotion over my mother. I'm totally humiliated. And as it turned <laughs> out, that was exactly when my brother's plane crashed. <gasps> oh, oh. oh. Later that, that day we got the phone call. Yeah. Wow. wow. Just... Okay, Mary and Tamerly, you have to write these <laughs> down. No, I mean, because that's interesting, um, Tamerly and Mary, there's always going to be talk about Fatima and that you had yeah. a relative that saw that's like yeah, yeah. that is big cool. there's a really good movie on Netflix on Fatima oh yeah, and yeah I think I think I, I haven't seen it but I know uh yeah yeah I know my mom spoke of it because yeah what's it called I remember a black and white one it's called yeah, I remember the black and white one where they were going to be boiled in oil we watched that in, in school. Oh, God. I mean, yeah. threatening to boil the kids in oil. Huh. Mm. Whoa. Scary. <laughs> All right. Mary, uh, Deirdre. Deirdre, you got a scary story? Well, um, <laughs> I, I really, I'm like, oh my gosh, what, 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 what? And then, um, you know, and I asked my parents, oh, I don't have anything. Oh, your father didn't have anything. I'm like, Okay, but this has always been a big deal for my mom. So I think it's because she was like traumatized to this day. And I think she like relayed those feelings down to my sister and I. So we're like careful around water. Let's just put it that way. So um, my sister and I were, um, well, my dad worked for the U.S. Forest Service. So we always lived in little towns where there was a Forest Service station. So in Oregon, Blue River, I mean, I don't know that anybody lived there except for the Forest Service housing, okay? And it's like 50 miles east of Eugene. So it's kind of halfway between Eugene and Bend, Oregon, which is in Central Oregon, if that means anything. So Blue River runs into the Mackenzie River because maybe you've heard of the Mackenzie River, that's kind of a bigger river. So it was 1964, so I'm um, three, and so my sister would be two. And so there's hardly any houses, it's just a little, a few houses, that's it, the town. And it, you can't call it a town, there's just a few houses. So it's raining, but you know, it's Oregon, it rains, this is not unusual, but. Uh, <laughs> So my mom, you know, it's dark, they're in bed, they can, she can hear boom, boom, she doesn't know what it is. And, um, you know, my dad's like, it's nothing, you know, I don't hear anything, whatever, you know, that's just kind of a guy thing, right? And um, so she, daybreak, she gets up, she looks out the window and there, so there's a blue river and then there's a street and then there are cows. But normally she can't see the river because 
the water level is very low. But she can see the water now because it's high enough. You know, it's still in the bed, riverbed though. On the other side of the river, she she watches the house fall into the water. Oh man. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh. So anyway, she just it the the boom boom at night was just I guess the the boulders. Oh yeah. She just has like a fear of water and yeah, <laughs> it didn't help. And was anybody in the house? Oh, uh, that's what I asked. And my mom's like, I, no, I don't think so. And my dad was on the phone call. And he's like, nobody was hurt from the the storm or anything. So it was just a house floating down the river. Don't worry. Right. But I, I think people got out, whatever. Talk yeah. about terrifying your kid. I'd be traumatized. Well, my mom was and is still to this day. And that was 1964. She probably never wanted to live near a river again. Oh, or, yeah. you know, did, you, did you move from, from forest to forest as a kid? What kind of places did you live? So I was born in Blue River and we were there I think she said um, four years or five years, and then moved to Cottage Grove, which is yeah, Oregon near, too. Yeah, oh, oh yeah. Oregon. Yeah. Western then, by the ocean, sort of. Western, yeah, Western yeah. by Eugene. I mean, not by the ocean. We weren't by, oh, the, ocean. by the ocean. Okay, yeah. more west, and then we moved. So we, Cottage Grove. I don't know how many years we were there. Maybe seven. Then we moved to Bend, Oregon. Oh, big town. Yeah, well, it was only 18,000 yeah. then. And it was 20 miles from the Forest Service Station, which was Sisters, Oregon, but that was tiny. And Oh, um, Sisters is a huge quilt place. Yeah, now it's a big oh, is quilt. that right? Yeah. yeah. But my mom's like, I'm not, we're not living in a teeny tiny town when you can commute, you know, 20 minutes. So then I lived there. I don't know, six years. And then we, my grandparents here in Slings were getting older. My mom's an only child. So we moved to King City because that's where the Forest Service Station is. And this is all federal? Federal. federal. Wow. Yeah. So a place to grow up though. It, you know what? Looking back, it was all idyllic. Yeah. Yeah. I had no big city experience at all, but um, yeah. <laughs> so then my other story, because these are small, um, my my grandfather, my mother's, my great grandfather, my my mom's grandfather, her mother's father, right in Italy during World War One, when he was, you know, a soldier, he was up in a mount up in the mountains, keep an eye out for the enemy with his company unit, whatever, um, the other guys. And it was in the winter and it was just horribly cold because well, you're up in the Alps and the mountains. And um, he, well, you've seen me, I'm very white. And he had very, very white skin, my mom said, but he was so pale they thought he was going to die. And they, so they sent him down to wherever the medic station was. And while he was there, his whole unit was killed. Why? Oh, yeah, I wouldn't be oh. here. If Oh, wow. That is definitely a tragedy that didn't, that means yeah. something to change the course of your family yeah. history. Killed from, from World War One or like a landslide or what? Oh, no. No, 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 whatever, whoever, I don't know the enemy there. That in a battle, out. yeah. In a battle, yeah. So he's the only one that survived. Yes. Because he was gone down the hill for medical treatment. So was he sick or was he just really white? He was just really white. <laughs> that will be a blessing to my youngest daughter. I'll let her know that it could be a lifesaver because she's probably <laughs> the whitest person I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, I know. Like when um, my grandchildren were born these girls like the first I'm like seriously like I can see like her veins her skin she's like transparent is she okay is this not? Yeah. I'm like oh god but 
And I thought Mary Jeanette was dead. <laughs> so there you go. Those are, those are good stories. Ooh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so I, I took a different spin on this assignment and maybe we'll say what I laboriously put together for another time. But in Mary's story, that clicked on something that reminded me that's sort of similar to what you're all talking about. And that's when Mary, my daughter Mary, was um, really young, a year old, year and a half old, something like that. Maybe two, no, younger than two. Anyway, I took her out for a bike ride and she was on one of those seats that's behind you, you know, um, probably a little bucket thing. I really don't remember the precise nature of, of the seat or the infant. Um, and, and so we were riding along and I fell, you know, I just lost my balance and fell. And she didn't have any protection on. I mean, that was kind of back before you didn't worry about that so much. And her car seat wasn't, or her bike seat wasn't anything special. And I, the bike fell and I jumped off the bike and ran to the back, expecting to see her, you know, smashed. And her head was resting on the curb, just laying there on the curb. Oh. <laughs> and not smashed, not hurt in the slightest, no scratch, no anything. And we say to this day that her guardian angel just came yeah. Put her hand under uh, Mary's head and you know, layered her down. That's scary. I mean, that's you know, there is no explanation. She should have been badly injured. Yeah. So I and she was still attached to the bike. So oh. I picked up the bike, yeah. and walked it home, <laughs> and yeah. never rode with her on the back of my bike. <laughs> <laughs> so that's. That's the guardian angel story that Mary, you were talking about angels, made me remember about that. Yeah. So the, the other thing I prepared, I was interpreting it to be an event in the ancestor's life that was transforming. And again, I mean, it, I can do that either now or next week or whatever. I picked World War II. Oh, and that's how I interpreted the assignment. <laughs> and I did World War II with my father as the focus of it, his experiences in World War II and how World War II affected the general population as manifested through my father's experience. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you want to do that now or save it or what. Uh, what else does everybody have? I have I have one story that I interpreted just like Cindy did. Something that happened in the greater world that really affected yeah. my family. Mine's maybe maybe 15 minutes, maybe 12 minutes. Yeah. Who else has got something? Because maybe we could just do them today. I mean, yeah, I, I well, it doesn't have to be anything like spooky, like Halloween, because I do have something that the you know did impact my family tremendously. So yeah did change the course of a lot of how long do you of, think yours is mary oh maybe 10 minutes less than that maybe five like you know but it, it just kind of evolves into present day i would say deirdre and tamperly do you have something you were going to do yeah <laughs> So what do you want to do, Cindy? How long do you think yours is going to go? Um, you know, the more I did it, the more I realized I could really go on with it. But I can make it mm, 20 minutes, maybe. So, so tell you what, all I, of us, we would be about 3.30 before we finish, yeah. that, right? Is that good for everybody? Yeah, I'm fine. All right, why don't the two of you go first? And then if it just gets too long, I'll do mine next week. Mary, why don't you go first? I want to hear uh, what this is. You do you like, want to turn your video back on? Is this stuff you want to show us? I don't know if this is like what you're like looking for. Um, I didn't interpret. It. I interpreted interpreted loosely so that you guys would be able to come up with whatever. You I wanted. loved. I loved loved the stories we all came up with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really cool. Like as far as um, so, my dad 
um, and pretty much my dad and his brother um, worked for Bethlehem Steel, which um, my uncle eventually retired out from. He was an engineer. He was very um, actually um, very successful. And my dad actually was on the kind of the coattails. He worked in the research Mary, you got to turn your video off. Oh, that's I'm still shut down. Which I think you have to turn off your video, Mary, and, and cutting out on us. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Well. Yeah. Um, but it. yeah, it, it totally changed everybody's life. Where it, it, it uprooted us to to have to move, um, and then it eventually. Um, led to a lot of medical problems for my dad because he ended up going undiagnosed with a heart condition and ended up passing away. Ugh. So, yeah, like, so it's just like, um, and I know other people had it worse. I mean, my family always kind of, you know, dug in and, and, and did different things. Like my dad, we ended up moving out to California and then moving back to Pennsylvania because we hated California. And um, he ended up going back to school and relearning, uh, basically getting uh, more of a applied science degree and started working his way up the ladder to manage a wastewater treatment plant. And literally before he died, he had this dream job and he finally like was happy because we were back, you know, in the state of Pennsylvania, back close to the family and everything. And then he died. So that like severely impacted our family for the good and for the bad. I mean, it's, you know, but just to look back and to think about that, that was like the one thing that like stuck out like a sore thumb just the whole like shutdown of the industrialization of, you know, of, of metal. Uh, it, it affected a lot of people. Mary, how old do you think he was when Bethlehem Steel closed? Uh, he was in his early forties. Oh, yeah. So, and he did come back. So he had, um, my dad was like really smart and he was working for um, AT&T. Um, and he was working in the manufacturing, like they, he was working with the microchips. And um, he had devised this contraption that would blow a puff of air across the microchips that would literally save the microchips from being damaged because like oh. a molecule of dust would crush these right. microchips. So he had given his prototype to somebody, I don't know who it was like in, his work chain of command, but then he got laid off. And eventually he went back to at and <clears throat> um, and they, they were using his invention. So, and, and, you know, he didn't want any money for it. He just wanted his name to be attached to that right. technology. So it was just, you know, so yeah. So that's oh yeah if he had lived i mean he clearly had smarts and yeah, he was so innovative he was he was so he grew up in town working for an eye doctor and he would fit people for glasses like he learned this mm -hmm. he got taught and he learned it and there were more people that were lined up to see my dad fix glasses <laughs> than the doctor yeah, yeah. because I have glasses and let me tell you, there are very few people who are, can do it well anymore. Yeah. When I was younger, yeah. they can do it well. They can't. Yeah. How yeah. old was your father when he died? 52. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. The family lost a lot. The the lot. lost yeah. a lot. Yeah, well he died in our house and he died, my mom, me and my mom were home at the time when he passed and, um, so like for years, it just like was really like a traumatic experience that I had to live through. But then I was like, one day I kind of like realized, I was like, you know what? You know, he could have died in public 
he could have died at work. He could have died among, you know, strangers and, you know, he didn't yeah. leave home for that. And it was, it was quick. So, but yeah, he was sick for a while, but yeah, he, he didn't linger, you know, but yeah, so. Yeah, that was, that's a big deal. Because to- he was the youngest, he was the youngest child and all the other siblings lived until like their late 80s, 90s. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Did he smoke? No. But from the lungs, from the working at the factory might have not helped. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I, yeah. Hmm. But yeah, that's, that's it. That was refreshing. <laughs> I'm afraid yeah. mine's not going to be any happier. <laughs> Here, I'll tell my. I'll, I'll give you mine. I don't think it'll be very long, but let's see. So this is something that um, affected my family. Totally changed changed everything in, that happened in my family. Oh, uh, tuberculosis. Oh. So I did a, I did some research on tuberculosis and I kind of tried to concentrate on tuberculosis in, in, in um, Arkansas. And during the years that my family would have been living there. Now, my aunt told me, because I was trying to find a death certificate from one of my family members or something, because they were dying very young. And she said, oh, Susan, it was tuberculosis that did it, you know? And I'm like, really? She says, yeah, there was epidemics of tuberculosis back then. And those places and I did what Deirdre suggested I did to do is I went to newspapers.com and I spent hours I found some really great newspaper articles that are hilarious well not hilarious but just amazing like a woman who gave birth to her 21st child and then she died a couple hours later yeah and, you know I was putting these up on Facebook and people were laughing at me you know they were saying where are you finding these and it was because I was trying to see I was trying to find a paper that was near where my family was in Arkansas and I found a paper that's you know a few miles away during this era and I was just going from I was reading every I was going through every page because what I was looking for is for if they would say an epidemic in town of tuberculosis or consumption or something and I never found it I just found you know I'd read the obituaries and there would be like you know, five or six obituaries over the year, maybe over a couple of years, and only one or two was tuberculosis. So it wasn't like an, ep- I don't know where they got the idea of it being an ep- epidemic in the area because there was nothing to show it unless there wasn't death certificates, which is likely because I didn't have any death certificates for my family member, but, or no newspaper announcement. So anyway, so tuberculosis, I was really looking at like 1900 to 1925 in Arkansas. And I learned that tuberculosis has been around forever. Egyptians, they think, uh, have uh, have had tuberculosis, but it was called consumption. And it was called consumption because it was due to weight loss. They said that the infection was spread by breathing and droplets from infected persons. So I guess, you know, like COVID is spread now, it's from a lot of it's your vapors in your mouth. Um, at one point it was called, and this, this is interesting. I found this at a few places. Great White Plague. I'm not exactly sure why they called it the White Plague because I think it I think it was more like your skin would be okay. white or something. I don't know. I, I enough white phlegm. Maybe. White phlegm. That's possible. Yeah, I don't know what the reason why they called it that because it wasn't a it wasn't a, a you know white person disease. People had it from you know. So I don't know why they called it but that, but they did. So currently, and this is another thing I didn't know. It's behind behind COVID nineteen for cause of death from an infectious disease. It is the second most infectious disease in the world right now. One percent of the population each year gets tuberculosis. Okay. That's a lot of people. That's a yeah. lot of people that are amazing. We're we're in, we're we should all probably be. That's like um, third world. Yeah, world. Yeah, so we yeah, should probably be all vaccinated. You take your T T DAP and your. Oh, yeah. um, so kids are. There's actually a pretty high rate of tuberculosis. There used to be in the Salinas area. Mm-hmm. Because oh, of uh, IV drug use. Immigrants. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Well, that makes sense. If you don't have it as a child, you're not likely to get the vaccine when you're older. It's uh, um, I remember worrying about it. Like if we were in church and somebody was like coughing really bad, my mom would make us move. And yes, geez. still floating around the room. Yes. So <laughs> I'd leave. I'd like, leave. Yeah. yeah. So here's here's a photo I have. You guys are seeing this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, a photo I found that kind of is what it would be like. These people would linger, some of them, for a very long time. So in 2020, just last year, 10 million people had it. Oh. And 1.5 million people worldwide died from it, which is just amazing. Yeah. It is. Half a million people died from this thing that's preventable. That, yeah, can be amazing. prevented. And you don't even think about it. I mean, I hadn't really thought about it. So the treatments for, for um, tuberculosis now is it requires multiple antibiotics over a long period of time, which, is, which leads to antibiotic resistance, which is a problem. And I remember this is that when people, I've heard of this, when they get tuberculosis, there was people insulin, as I remember this, that wouldn't take their full course of tuberculosis medicine. You know, sometimes there were people who were transients or, you know, just living yeah. uh, on the streets and stuff. And so that they would put them in a housing or someplace kind of like where they could keep an eye on them. So they're making sure they're getting their drugs because otherwise what's the point? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it says that in incubation is three to four weeks before the, before the new case is infectious, which makes it really bad because you can catch it. And then you can get far away in three to four weeks and spread it to a whole new community that was yeah. not uh, prepared to have tuberculosis. So here's something else I knew. I didn't know what they would do is they believed the treatment was sunshine and fresh air. Fresh so, air. Yeah. So here's, here's the tuberculosis clinic. I don't think this is Arkansas. I can't quite remember, but they would put these people in the beds outside and they'd spend hours and hours and hours outside like that so that they would be able to uh, get their their fresh air so the um i think i have another picture here's a, here's a little boy he's getting his schoolwork done outside he's all wrapped up and he's he's outside getting his fresh air for the day but he would stay out there for hours see how they've got it, him all pinned up and everything so i guess he's making it really hard if you had to go to the bathroom or something but um what what ended up happening is they really started doing a campaign on how to um educate people so they were telling people you can't spit you know don't no spitting because that was spreading the stuff you know if you're going to cough you have to cough in your shoulder or your arm or something like that and so there was a lot of education about um what to, what to do about it so these these slides are in a little random order I'm not even sure to have. Here's another camp. Poverty was another really big problem. They put them in these little wasting away camps where they could just spread it to each other, I guess. And you sit around outside, but there was, it was very, you know, it was a poverty disease because of course you couldn't afford to go to a sanitarium. If you were, if you were not white, there wasn't very many places for you to go to. Even it was difficult to get in as a white person, but the, but they had segregation, especially in the South and Arkansas. So if you were black, you had a very low chance of getting into a sanitarium. They had one in Arkansas for black people, but it was like 30 beds, whereas the white population was had hundreds of beds. So it was spread a lot by um, poverty. Here's a child who's in bed and they've got the, they've extended her bed. So her head is sitting out the window. So if you can see the window is open and they've got it covered up with some kind of cloth but her head's in the in the opening so that she could be cured. I guess that was about all they had. Here's another little girl um, in another po in very impoverished area where she's, um, you know, they're living in a camp. They don't have clean ways it, it, ways of becoming, you know, washing things and, and uh, cooking and so on. So not only did it breed tuberculosis, but there was other things that, of course, diphtheria and, and other kinds. This is a very famous photograph from 1885, about the time as the other side of the family, the uh, Dales, were um, going through the yellow fever. But there was a lot of art inspired by, by death, especially, you know, a lot of it from this tuberculosis time. Oh, here's another thing I found that um, tuberculosis was found in bison in Wyoming over 17,000 years ago. 
and wow. it came and it moved to humans. So it was one of those animals to to uh, humans thing. So this is this is one of my relatives. This is um, this is a great great grandmother. No great grandmother. I'm confused right now. She is. Um, she she. Where's my notes on this? Um, I think I thought I'd had this memorized. So this is this is one of my ancestors. Now the picture on the right was carried in the wallet of somebody for for years, so it looks thrashed, and that's the only picture there was of her. So somebody tried to have it restored, and that's the best they came up with is what you see on the left hand side. So that's the restored version of a photograph that somebody carried around of their mom, and this is my grandmother Myrtle, um, Myrtle Mildred, Mildred. So she she was also somebody who died from tuberculosis. She died in 1924 and she, my mother was three. And my mom remembers that, she remembers that uh, the only story she can really remember of her mom, she has two stories. One was that my mom was being fussy and didn't wanna eat. She was being silly, whatever, she's three. So her mom, this woman right here, who was really sick, said, bring her over to me and uh, give me a plate and put her food on my plate, on the plate. And then I will feed her, you know, from one side of the plate, but not the other. And so that's what my, she was able to spoon feed my mom who was having a fit, but she said that everything was sterilized, that they always had to sterilize everything around, but, you know, she's still living in the house with all the kids and everybody else. And. Of course, you know, that could spread it to someplace else. So, so I guess that's it. This, her, what am I, what was the part about this thing? Let me think. I wrote this a little over a week ago and I can't remember. She was, her and her husband, that's what made me start on this. Her and her husband, the woman I showed you that with a weird picture, her and her husband both died of tuberculosis at a very young age. I think they made it to, um, I think they died about 10 years apart from each other, but it was both tuberculosis and it was, oh, here it is. I wrote it on a note, put it over in a different place. So her name was Josie Bowles, B-O-L-E-S. And my great, great grandfather was William Jasper Finley. They called him Bud. And he died, they were married about 10 years and he was a farmer and um, he died Oh, she was 15 when they got married and he was 30 and she was pregnant about four months pregnant when she, when he finally died and he died when he was 40, I think, and she ends up dying about 10 years later. So she is, um, they went on to have Myrtle, Gertie, Asa, Della, and Willie. And so Myrtle was the woman I showed you the picture of that I told the story of that my mom remembers her feeding her, hand feeding her. And then um, Myrtle was married to my grandfather, John. And that's the one that I should, I told you about earlier that was uh, with the yellow fever, that he was, you know, one of the children born right after all the other kids died. So Myrtle and John got married and they, uh, um, and Myrtle had my mom and a bunch of other kids. And then she died of tuberculosis. And then we, the other kids, Gertie, Asa, and Della, and Willie were all living with different relatives because their parents, Josie and, and Jasper Bud, had died. And Willie moves in with my grandfather, who is in his 40s, I think. And he's got a boatload of kids, and his wife has died. So she's living with them to help out with the family help out with the kids and she ends up getting pregnant from my grandfather okay. so my grandfather ended up marrying myrtle the oldest daughter in the family oldest child and then he ended up marrying willie who was the youngest child so my sister my grandmother my grandfather married his my grandfather married sisters that's easy yeah. way to explain it okay. the oldest in the family and the youngest in the family so i didn't know myrtle because she died in her 20s but Willie, I actually kind of knew. I mean, I talked to her on the phone a few times, but 
So, so this tuberculosis. Your grandmother really, that was also your great aunt. Yes. So my, my aunt Peggy, who is, you know, I'm close to, lives in Arkansas still. She is my aunt and she's my cousin because of the the thing so the other things i was going to mention let me just go through this really quick because i made some notes so about tuberculosis in the 1700s to the 1800s tuberculosis was associated with vampires okay. there's my halloween reference mm -hmm. uh, because one person in the family would get sick and then slowly the others would have their life drained from them so that's they kind of thought of it as a vampire disease in europe in the 1600s it started to, to, to get even worse, but by the 1800s, it started, it was causing 25% of deaths. Can you imagine that? A quarter of the population was dying because of this. It took all the way until the 1950s to get it turned around. And that's what I was talking about with, they started educating people and then they created some vaccinations and better sanitation and uh, better medications. It was also called a romantic disease because so many people in art and literature have had tuberculosis. So there was a widespread belief that tuberculosis helped people see life more clearly yeah. and assisted an artistic talent. That's an interesting thought, huh? To, to think that you're, you uh, want to become, you might want to catch TV because you'll be a better poet, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so they called it the artistic disease for a very long time. And so people would go to the sanitariums. And so it was, they didn't realize they thought it was genetic they didn't realize it was being spread by by aerosol you know contagious so that caused a lot of problems too because you've got a lot of people interacting with other people and um only treatments were outdoor air or they could surgically collapse a lung and allow the lung to recover and then in 1938 in Arkansas, because I was looking at kind of whenever one of those people were dying, there wasn't a lot of great numbers for tuberculosis in Arkansas going way back. As I said, they didn't even have a, they didn't, my family didn't even have death certificates. So in 1938, which is the only time I could find, the oldest I could find, there were still a thousand people dying in Arkansas a year. They said that part of the problem was the doctors couldn't diagnose it because they didn't have x-ray machines because it was too impoverished. There were x-ray machines, but doctors didn't have access to them, especially in remote areas. So people were dying of tuberculosis and some of them, we don't even know if they were dying of tuberculosis. So I guess it could have been a real big deal, but we, you just, you know, you would know of somebody who died of it, but it wasn't, I don't know if I would call that an epidemic if you, I, I don't even know how to, what, how the, why my aunt would say epidemic, because I, like I said, I could find nothing in papers. And I looked for years and years trying to find out, you know, a headline saying, don't spit on people or something. <laughs> Endemic, E-N. Endemic. Like it was just prevalent, always present. Yeah, um, I didn't realize it was so, you know, I don't know why I didn't think of it as a, a huge killer, I guess, because you always hear about heart disease and cancer. But then again, you think about it, cancer isn't infectious and you have to usually get to a certain age before you get the cancer. So these people are all dying off of other things, you know, getting their hands caught in molasses gins and, <laughs> and uh, falling in a river. Um, you know, they're not necessarily making it to be old enough to die of cancer. So, so cancer, um, and again, it wasn't contagious, but tuberculosis is a nasty thing i didn't really i really didn't realize how bad it is today people are dying from it who yeah. really don't have to well in yeah. the 80s when i worked at, out at alice l school district it, you know and, and as a in public education you have to have a tb test every five years yeah. um, it was not uncommon in hr you have to keep all the records right. it wasn't yeah. uncommon that people that uh, worked there that did not have TB um, got TB within the five year time period just because of so many people from unvaccinated countries coming in. And the stupid thing about the California Ed Code is it required a TB test every five years or proof of no TB every five years 
from regular employees, but not temporary employees? Oh, because they're only there temporarily. So we'd hire all these temps to work in the, in the cafeteria yeah. and food service. <laughs> yeah, oh. And not have to test them. Oh. And you're going, geez, yeah. So I guess I should pull it back to how it actually affected my family so much. I mean, my because these two people, Josie and her husband, Bud, died so young you know they're they're pretty young when they died i think she was he was 40 she was 30 something like that the kids were all kind of separated and to go on your own yeah, way and these are mostly people that i know of you know i've got pictures of them and, yeah. and asa is the one that had his arm caught in the molasses gin so oh. that lived in sacramento and i actually knew him but they all um had you know, it was a really, it was my grandfather's family. And so they just didn't, you know, it was just really turned the whole family in turmoil, just a mess. Oh, and, yeah. and, and, my, and my grandmother dying so young, it's just kind of sad, you know, that I didn't even have a chance to know of her. I've got two photos of her. They're awful, but that's it. No stories. Oh, the only other story my mom tells is my mom remembers when I put her in the back of the wagon in a box, take her away be buried that's all she remembers those two small stories wow very sad huh she's right. like three yeah so my great great grandfather in the 1870s was the superintendent of a tb sanatorium oh really and Did then he died outside and everything he ended up like in minnesota he ended up dying of consumption and then his daughter, my great grandmother, lost two of her kids to TV. Yeah, I think about twenty five percent of the population. Twenty five percent of the population dying of tuberculosis. It really shows you um, wow, how in the heck is we survive? I mean, how far we've come, but how far we haven't come with with public health and sanitation. I mean, look at now with COVID. You know, yeah. poor poor areas don't have access to the kind of healthcare they need, you know, it's like not having the x-ray so machines so you don't get diagnosed just because you're in a poor region. Well, you, got cities, you got cities in this country that you can't even use our tap water. Can you imagine that? Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Stuff, right. You know? Just, and you know, those are all the low income, those people can't move. When we know better. It's hard to go anywhere else. We yeah. know better, that's the thing. Right horrible it's like a, it's, a, it's like a vicious circle it's horrible right right and with people that really don't have choice it's not like you said well they should just move yeah well no, that's can. not available to everyone yeah, yeah. it's just very sad yes. so okay i'm done <laughs> I, i'm right. sorry that that wasn't any more pleasant than the story that <laughs> the stories right. we've already heard and now we're about to hear another uplifting story of death in world war ii <laughs> No, can you no. end on a high note, Cindy, so we can leave people I, 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 yeah. <laughs> Or I'll, I'll okay. send you links to pictures of kittens and puppies playing together. Yeah, now I'm going to try to do spring share again, as always. Let's see if I can find oh, it. We'll just practice. Yes, there it is. Okay. I think that's okay. Let me go to the beginning. Oh, oh. that's cute. And you'll get there. Don't look, cover your eyes. Yeah, don't look. <laughs> okay, now I need to go to, what do I need to go to? To get you to, to, go to start to, to slideshow. I'm looking for slideshow, sorry. No, there it is, yeah. I see it. Okay, really, honestly, it's terrible, I can't see. So you have to go to slideshow and then you have to hit from, start from current slide. So there go back up to slideshow. Yeah. And then don't let go. Oh, and go yes, over from the beginning. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. I don't know what I do without you guys. All right. World War II. Um, and there's the larger picture of World War II. And there's my father's and mother's story um, and family of World War II. So this is only concentrating on the United States, not the rest of the world, not anything else. Uh, because it's the effect of my, my parents. So in general, 
the war, World War II, started in September of 1939 and went to September of 1945. So six years in a day, basically. Of course, the United States didn't enter into it until uh, Pearl Harbor in 1941. Uh, per FamilySearch.com, over 16.5 million men and women served in the armed forces during World War II. And I believe that's the United States, um, of whom 2,000, uh, almost 2,902 died in battle. 144,000 died from other causes and 671,000 were wounded. So 16 million point five fought and 292 died okay. in, in battle. Um, my father entered the service in November of 1942, according to my notes, but on his army enlistment thing on Ancestry, it says January of 1943. Um, so it may be that one was a sign up and one was when he actually went. Oh, yeah. Okay, so there is a picture of my father as a uh, little, he first joined as a private in the army and then he quickly was put into officer cadet school. Uh, and I think this, I'm not sure which one this is. But anyway, it's early in his, his career. And so he went two years of officer cadet school. And you think of people signing up for the army and going to war, but they, at least in my father's case, he went through training uh, in, in et cetera before he, he went. And he um, was stationed at the air base outside of Salt Lake City. The name escapes me at the moment. But that is where he met my mother. <laughs> and there is my father and mother on their first date. How I see Mary. I see Mary. You see Mary? Yeah, yeah I sure do. So, Smile. In yeah. your mom's face. Yeah. So um, they, the story is that my dad met, actually met my mother's roommate at, <laughs> I don't know, some bar party or something. And he, he wasn't interested in her. And she says, okay, you know, smart ass, I'll show you somebody you will be interested in, my roommate. So they arranged this dinner, and I believe this is that night, because this is cropped from a larger picture that has the other, the third person is the roommate. And uh, it, it says in my notes, or from their stories, my mom walked in in this really cute red dress, and she's only 4'11", he's like 5'4". And... Um, you know, that was, that was it, basically. Uh, also, aww. she's like the only person that could ever follow him because he was a fancy dancer. Uh, and they, uh, they met about January 9th, 1944, and were married on January 19th, 1944. So, what? Wow. Wait, wait, what? wait, say and the that's better, Because he was being sent to Texas to go to school. He had the choice, he, he, my dad was really smart and he scored high enough that he could have been trained as a pilot, a navigator or a bombardier. And he chose to be a bombardier uh, because it was the quickest school so that he could get going on this war. And so he was being transferred to Texas um, to learn to be a bombardier. And so, you know, they got married. Week. Two weeks. So he could come. She could wow. Come yeah. What a so. world when World War II was. Yes. Yeah. And just think how long you knew Pat before you got married. Say it again. What? And think how long you knew Pat before you got married. I, yeah. Well, we did it in like eight or nine months. I mean, oh, yeah. it, oh, oh, for some reason, I thought it was longer than that. Oh. No. So, um, and, and my mother says that she got pregnant on her wedding night because what? they were, yeah, so uh -huh. January 19th, my sister was born October 12th. 
So that's basically shaking. Sure. Well, so, we know it couldn't have been much sooner because they got over two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> Pretty close. So, okay, so they married 10 days later on January 19, oh. uh, 1944. And this is another cute picture of them. Oh. So, oh, yeah, and my dad's got on his shirt, he's got some of his medals or signatures or bars, whatever they're called. Okay. So my sister and my dad and my mom, and he's got stuff on his shirt. Yeah. So my mom went to North Dakota, mine at North Dakota, to have Jenny, was her name. And well, and 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 then he went off. First they went to Texas, then after she was born, and my dad was then sent on to um uh, da, 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 da. First to Hawaii and then to Palu in the South Pacific. And this book is from his class of Bombardier School. And that's where I got that first initial picture of him. And the story behind this book is that when I first started doing genealogy and working on the Smiths and making connections, my dad had a cousin named Homer. Homer, what was his last name? Anyway, very unusual last name. And with the first name Homer, I was able to find him just like through white pages. And we had lovely conversation and talked and he connected me on to oh. other people who knew more things. When my dad got this yearbook, he did not send it home to his parents because there was lots of problems in his family. He sent it to his aunt Marie, Homer's mother. Doxy was their last name, D-O-X-E-Y. And this book sat in their shed for 50 years or whatever. Oh my it was, goodness. Until I contacted Homer. And, and then he sent it off to me. Wow. So I, that's you know really special. Anyway, I digress. Um, so he was in the 7th Air Force 494th Bombardier Group, 864th Squadron out of a group Palu. And they had a airplane that they nicknamed uh, the I'll Get By. And that was the uh, also my mother and his song. It's a J Henry J Harry James song, I'll Get By. Oh. Yeah. And he the plane was a B-24 Liberator plane. Supposedly, at one time, he was the youngest second lieutenant or officer or something in the Air Force. Um, so he, as I said, he was a bombardier. And a bombardier, I don't know how much you're familiar, but that's the thing where, where the airplane is here and there's like a little bubble kind of under the airplane. The bombardier gets down into there and, and drops the bombs on the bombing runs. And there's a point in the flight where he takes control of the plane. Um, so that he can get things just right to drop the bombs. And he's you know, obviously well exposed in that situation. Wow. So they did, I can't remember the number, I'm thinking 24 or something or so flights. And then they got shot down. Oh, what? Yes. So normally there's nine people on the plane, um, you know, four officers and the gunners and different crew but they the day of that flight they had some observer with them so there were 10 and they were shot down they um on over the Duval penal colony in Mindanao the Philippines the Japanese prisoner of war camp basically oh, wow. and really close to it I mean you know like they could see the the thing so that was seven, September 17th, 1945. So he hadn't really been over in the Philippines very long. The plane caught fire after hit, being hit by flat. All 10 bailed out. And I think my dad was like the second to the last, the, cap, the captain or the pilot being last. And they landed in the jungle, spent three days in the, or he did, spent three days in the jungle. Um, they, they, he, eventually found one other guy kind of who was thrashing about the jungle and 
my dad kind of took charge of him. And then they connected others. And um, they, they came upon a little boy who had been fishing and knew what this was about. Apparently the Filipino gorillas were aware and he called them to come with him and, and they went and they came up upon a group of Filipino gorillas, a unit who my dad says gave him the best salute, you know? Really? Ever. Yeah. And so they finally rounded up all 10 of them and they were able to contact uh, the Navy. I guess wow. it was a Navy, a Navy and pilot who landed a seaplane um, right under the guns of the Japanese, I'm quoting from articles, and hauled the Air Force guys out. Uh, so they, they were like, he was three days in the jungle and then 10 days before he got to go home. So, uh, and, and they had, quote, a practice run later, this, this unit, um, my dad's unit, and full of supplies that just happened to go over where the Filipino base was and dropped off supplies for them. Um, he was awarded the Purple Heart. So the story about this is told in two places. One was, um, do you remember the show, This Is Your Life? Any yeah. of you old enough to remember that? So this, there's a, it was a summer replacement called um, It Could Be You. Mm. And this whole story was told there. Oh, and wow. they, they took the pilot as the focus and they brought out these men one at a time. And we got to stay up and watch it. We stayed at friend's house and I remember watching it. And it was like the first time they'd been together in 11 years or something like that. Your dad was on the show? Yeah. Wow. He, yeah. So they brought the pilot out and said, this, is, this is, could happen to you. And they started telling this story and they brought out each of the other nine guys one at a time. And my dad being, of course, uh, as one of the four officers was one of the first or second to come out. And yeah, I got to see my dad on television. Oh, and, is there a recording of that somewhere? I don't know. Oh, how know. cool. So anyway, the other thing and let me go back to my story here. Yes, so this is an article that appeared in this thing called the, um, the Brief. Yeah, I don't know what it's called. And it's, it's like a, a military magazine. And you can see it's got the appropriate pinup girl in it. Uh -huh. Let's see if I can. So this is like the first page and you can see underground in Palu. I'm not even going to, you know, attempt to make it bigger, but it, it talks about much of what I just said about them crashing in the jungle. My dad said the biggest problem was leeches. He had leeches all the time. And uh, it just goes oh, Sorry, up, upside down, but you just have to take my word for it. I'm not, oops, my internection, internet connection is unstable. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so I think this is supposed to be an image of, of you know, them meeting up with the um, Filipino gorillas. But if that's supposed to be my dad, that he's really short. He's probably the same size as the Filipino gorillas. And, and you can see them with long hair and beards and all that. Well, they were only in the jungle like three days. So <laughs> you know. anyway, so, so I, I have this wonderful article. This is the crewmen, not, not the officers, the crewmen. Um, so anyway, they came home and uh, he, after the war, he was a captain, a, a wartime captain. And after the war, they kind of lost rank. So then he was going to be back to a first lieutenant. And um, he didn't want that. But he did stay in the army for a year, hoping that they would work that out. And so he spent a year as a procurement officer um, in charge of PX and stuff. And so even if they fixed it, he was going to have to wait. Um, 
Oh, and not even a second, he, he would have to have been a second lieutenant and would have had to wait until he was 28 to become a first lieutenant. And he was only 22 or 23 at the time. And he just felt, you know, he just couldn't do that kind of thing. So he resigned. So in the meantime, um, my mother's sister married a man named uh, Rick Bile is his last name. It was Richard Rick Bile. He called, was named Ricky. That's what he went by. And he lived in Klamath Falls, Oregon, had a jewelry store. And he told my dad that if he would um, get his gemology certificate, that he could become the manager of the store. And so my dad used the GI Bill to get his gem gemologist certificate. Um, they talked about doing a four-year course. Oh, no, supposedly he did a two-year course or four-year course in eight months and then used the rest of the GI Bill for other courses like advertisement. And Lois, and my dad and mom decided they didn't want to college, go to college on a college campus because they didn't like the family housing. Um, and then it turned out the service did want him after all and would accommodate his rape situation, but he declined. And his unit was called up for Korea, but he was not reserved, so he didn't have to go. Um, but then he thought about going anyway, wait until the birth of my brother. So when we were in Klamath Falls, I was born. Klamath Falls, I'm a fellow of Gordian, uh, Derby. And so I was born in 48, and then my brother was born in 50. And right, you know, Korea War. So, uh, he did not go. So the post-war, let me see what I have next on here. No, okay. So the post-war, the GI Bill was a really big deal in our lives as a family and, and well, the whole society. So it's actually called the Serviceman Re Readjustment Act of 1944. And it gave... Um, you know, funding for college and vocational schools, housing and unemployment insurance. So there was a huge housing boom, uh, which we took advantage of and we got a house, but we were, we had moved from Klamath Falls, Oregon to, um, sorry. Well, that's this neighborhood. Uh, Just a minute, it's Mary. Hello, can I call you back in a little bit? Okay, well, I'm in. Okay, this is my genealogy group, so. Okay, bye. It's Mary Jeanette. Um, okay, so Serviceman Readjustment Act, baby, or so the housing boom. We had moved from Klamath Falls, Oregon to California and then moved into our house in Concord where we, the family lived for the rest of their lives. Um, so this is, this is before we moved. So this must have been somewhere up in Oregon. No, well, I'm not sure. My, my, that's my father and that's my sister. Um, who I've talked about before was killed in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And, huh? I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, let me back up. So my brother was born in 1950 and I'm thinking he's what, nine months old or something like that. Oh. And there's me and I you can always tell it's me because there are glasses on because I got my first glasses when I was like 18. You got glasses on there? Yeah, it's kind of hard to see, but they're there. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had glasses since I was 18 months old. So. Um, she looks so old. She, there's three and a half years between us. She, I know, she, she was, this is, she died when she just had turned seven. So, I don't know, but that, that you know, that is the facts. I was born in March of 48 and she was born in October of 44. So 
you know, three plus. Um, oh, this is out of order. This is a picture of my mother that was probably um, her high school graduation. And so that meant to be up when, when I showed about my dad's first military picture. And, and that would have been her. She left, I, and I skipped the whole thing. She was um, graduated from high school and got on a bus from Minot, North Dakota and went to Salt Lake City all by herself, which seems like an incredible feat at the time. And she went to work at an instrument factory, airplane instrument factory in Salt Lake City, which is why she was in Salt Lake City and why, you know, where, where they met. So, and the whole Rosie the Riveter thing is like a whole nother topic I won't even get into, but I was telling Jana about some of this and she says that her mother had been accepted to college and that when uh, the soldiers came back, she was told, the mother, her mother was told that she no longer had a place that they needed to make room for the men coming back. So, you know, things have really changed. But once the cat was out of the bag, you know, that women's rights and everything were bound to happen. Because remember, the war started, well, for us, 41, and what women's right to vote was 17 or 20 or, I don't know. Anyway, not that long before that war. All right, so, uh, sorry, I, meant to I didn't get these all fixed. Um, this is in Richmond, California. This is my brother and me and my dad. My sister has passed away by then. And then we moved. Okay, so this is... Oh, there's glasses. This is my ideal family picture. Um, this is my mom and dad. This is in Concord. Uh, this brother Mike has been added to the family. So I think I'm... Let's see. He's You look like I, seven. Yeah, so this is probably about 1960, 59, something like that. Yeah. Gosh, and, your mom and married. Look at that. Super yeah. cute. She looks so much like your daughter. Yeah. So my brother Mike says this picture, it, it, she, this is my brother Jim, who's kind of got some spacey problems, always has. There's Mike, you know, yay, I'm here, I'm life of the party. And he <laughs> says, this is me looking at what's going on and figuring it out, you know, understanding what's going on. So, I, you know, it's kind of a nice compliment. And then this is my parents at their 50th wedding anniversary. They were married for almost 60 years. Wow. Which is pretty remarkable for people that met each other and got married in, in days. So let me see any more final notes. So the GI Bill, as I said, the housing boom, also the baby boomers, as you know, children born 1946 to 1964. I was born 48, so I was you know close at the beginning. Um, the one sad thing is that I believe my father had post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, he did have an alcohol problem, although it also runs in his family, and I do think that time in the jungle did affect him far worse than he would ever admit, but he talked about it a lot when we were children, uh, especially when he had a little too much to drink. So if you were interested in researching um, more details, a couple of notes, there were actually four World War II drafts. There was the young men's draft, which for people 18 to 45, and that was done in 41, I think. And then as it became needed, there was a couple others. And then I think the final one was the one that's called the old man's draft. And my grandfather, who was born in 1897 um, or six, was part of that draft. So it, you know, by the time the war was over, now this doesn't mean they served, but registered for the draft. And in Pat's family, his grandfather was of just the right age to have registered for World War I draft 
and also part of the old man's draft registering for um, World War II. So he's in both. Um, and there was a fire in St. Louis repository where a lot of military records were kept and quite a few got burned, but it's, and some of that has to do with my father, stuff, his records. I have a lot of his stuff because he kept it. And I mean, I've got tons of stuff and my brothers have some things. Um, if you want to know, familysearch.org in their wiki, look under World War II. And I, I need to say in searching, sometimes searching World War II is the two um, capital I's and sometimes it's the numeral two. Oh. But if you look under World War II with the two capital I's, the Roman numerals I's, under United States military records, there is a ton of stuff there and explanations and dates and timetables. And that's really the place to start. Cindy's list has World War II that's good. And um, Ancestry has some, it has like the draft and a couple other things. But when I looked in the card catalog, the thing that I found interesting is if you look for your state. So for example, it had something to do with people, Kalamazoo. I don't remember what it was exactly, um, and Ohio, and you know places like that to look under the state. So that is, in a nutshell, World War II and the effects upon my family. I've never heard any of that. Yeah. I'm so glad you shared that. I I hadn't yeah. heard any of that. Interesting. Have you heard some of that? No, I didn't know much of anything. You always talk about Pat's family. Well, yeah, because I'm working on that. Right, but we I've not sure. heard anything much about your family at all. Yeah. It's your grandmother that you, you're trying to find her adoption. Right. Yeah, That's his mother, my father's mother, who, who died while he was in the military. So that he came home. Really? Yeah. I don't remember what the sequence was, but he was able to visit her in the hospital. So you think... So your your the moral of your story is that the World War II brought your parents together to meet and forced yes. them to get married quickly because your dad was about to leave and they had to make a decision let's get married because we're right. going to be separated and also how important it was to uh, the the government bill the GI bill was to yes. your family and then as you said and lots of other families too yeah. yeah oh yeah and also the possibility that your father had ptsd yes. and contributed to some alcoholism and stuff too yes yes and and i made a decision at one point not to drink not to drink yeah until well, that, plane, that plane crash probably caused some tbi too yeah. which is some big, what you know traumatic, traumatic brain, brain injury and then that's like PTSD. I mean, it just it yeah. just unravels a whole bunch of different physical and mental issues with TBI. If you, especially if you go undiagnosed, then that's like what a lot of soldiers have issues with, right? So too, but you know, being a pilot and all those stressful situations and getting bumped and banged around and then probably didn't help. And then to and then to find out your mom dies. Yeah. Yeah, why you that. weren't there? Yeah, you no, know, you know, he was there, but but mm. she she's the one that died in the kitchen from burns from the kitchen fire. Yeah, oh. I don't remember this story either. So oh. where have you been hiding all your family history? I don't know. I know behind Pat, the sugar getting to you, Susan. <laughs> I don't yeah. remember. I must have been missing that day. I don't remember that. So the GI Bill is generally seen as the great equalizer for higher education which used to be in the hands of upper, you know, middle, middle, upper middle class white males. Mm -hmm. But because of the GI Bill, all of a sudden education, funding for education was across the board for people in service. So you had people that weren't from upper middle class and people that were people of color that now had funding to go to college. And it's also what's looked at as bringing, um, bringing immigrants, you know, first generation, and in particular, first generation Catholics out of the cities, which they 
tended to be wrapped around and out into the suburbs. Mm -hmm. It used to be Catholic and immigrant and city were together mm -hmm. and Protestant and suburban were outliers and that caused the ability of, of people to migrate across kind of the class and the religious divide and get out to the suburbs and have education and professional degrees where if it hadn't been for the GI Bill, there would have been that larger chasm. How did they manage to pay for that GI Bill? I don't know anything about it. Was it just like uh, they're trying to do with same, this? Same way they're paying thing? for it now. I mean, it still exists. Yeah. In a lesser form. But it's just funded by your I'm tax good. dollars. And just putting back to your community, building these, right. you know, funding these things is what they well, eventually ended up paying, you know, because the, now these people have higher education, they're able to right. get jobs, they're able to Very contribute know. more taxes well, to. I got the and, and, bill and you had to pay into it. You had to pay $100 a month for a year and then you got the GI bill. And yeah. now, oh, is that right? Yeah. And now like depends on your contract. Now they right. actually have college funds where they'll pay off like prior college, like they'll pay off like $25,000 worth of student loans, stuff like that. Plus not only that, in addition to that, they also have vocational rehab. So if you're a certain percent, percentage disability rated through the VA from a service connected illness or disease, go to school for free, but it's, yeah, you know, yeah. there's a lot of resources. So would men have been able to participate in the GI Bill if they hadn't contributed after World War II? Or was it? Um, I don't know. How that, I think that changed. I think that that was it was different um, back then. I don't know much. I mean, yeah. The, my husband. The Act of 44. And then I think, yeah. like Mary's saying, there was another one later. Yeah. My husband did two years as a full-time full-time army, full-time student at uh, University of Texas El Paso to finish up his bachelor's all on the army. So he I was- I my dad didn't use it. I, he was, a, I mean, two years getting his army pay, getting his billeting pay, getting all of that for two years, but didn't have to show up for duty and just went to school on the army for two years. Yep. He didn't get to choose his major like he would have. I mean, they weren't willing to pay for American lit, but- <laughs> Interpretive yeah. dance. Yeah, but, you know, he's there with a family with kids and he's getting his regular army paycheck every month and he got to grow a beard for two years. <laughs> did he Great. did he get to um did he get to pick the university you went to or was it they picked it? No, he got to choose because he had to get you had to get admitted. Mm -hmm. I mean choose within. I think it probably had to be somewhat near because that's what is that Fort Fort Hood? Is that what's out there? In Texas? It was different. Near Fort, Fort Hood, Fort Sam Houston. Yeah, I think Fort Hood is what he had been attached to when he got back after his second tour, I think. Oh, yeah. So when I opened up this book just today, there was a piece of paper in there. And I went, what is this? And it was uh, something from Roots Web. So I'm not even sure I can find it. But there's a uh, Military Bombardiers of World War II, a website dedicated to the bombardiers and the listing and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I guess I better look into that. So what's the difference between a bombardier and a gunner? A gunner was and a bombardier is like opening the bays to yeah, exactly. Aiming the target. And he has to aim everything and then open. So that's why he would take over control of the plane and you know guide the like plane. scope to look in how you know he was five foot two you said i wonder if that was a real benefit to being a bombardier to maybe be actually, he, was, he was actually <laughs> when he went into the army he was five three but when he became an officer he was five four so there may have been a height a requirement, requirement. Yeah. yeah oh i see what you mean he yeah. grew an inch uh-huh uh -huh. well he was <laughs> uh -huh. kind of could have grew. Yeah, it could have. Huh? He was only 20. So Matthew's a Marine and he shrunk because of but, Yeah, Very, very interesting, that. Cindy. It, all of you guys, it's made me really think about, you know, how I'm glad I did the assignment on tuberculosis because yes. I knew so little about it and, and yeah. thinking about how, how much 
that impacted the family in a, and families all over. Same with same sure. with what you guys have mentioned too. It's it's you know it shows how connected we are in a lot of ways. You know, it, it, we as in the greater sense of people. Right. What are we going to do next, Cindy? What are you going to sign us next? No, no. Or should we make should we make Tamberly, Tamberly uh, and Deirdre come up with their story for next week? Well, I, now that you've heard what we did, I know I wrote down a topic um, because there was a, a certain point. I remember my grandmother vaguely saying. Uh, prohibition and they had to throw out the wine that they had <gasps> oh no and how it affected your family that would have been well, I'm sure they my grandmother was totally traumatized because she had to have her wine but um <laughs> I don't know that I can find information but it kind of I'm like I mean it affected that would be fun. or two that would, yeah. diagnosis, but I think I it's interesting even... learning about each other's family and expanding our knowledge of families and history because yeah. i mean we all live through, <laughs> all live through the prohibition <laughs> bless you susan sorry 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 i just don't know if i can get it together by thursday it's my well mind. you know there's all kinds of topics we can do i mean unless you guys have other ideas we could pick and the uh, only thing i worry about is yeah. as wonderful this is and as good as it is to understand our families we aren't doing hardcore genealogy research, are we? Well, in the way we are, we're expanding. Look at what you found. Forced to go do this today, Cindy. You found a flyer inside yeah. a book that you haven't looked at in years about bombardiers. Right. And now you can learn more about that. So, right. I mean, you already knew all about your dad. Right. But I think it'd be interesting to find that TV show he was on. Yeah, I don't know. What was it called oh, again? Um. It's called, it, could, it was a summer substitute for This Is Your Life, and it was called, It Could Happen to You or something, let's see. Well, let me try looking up um, This Is Your Life, but anyway, maybe I'll try to take a look around at This Is Your Life to see if maybe, if there's a... It could be, it could be you was the summer replacement for This Is Your Life. It could it have been could what? Be you. Could be you. It could be you? It could be you. And she knows what year it was. Roughly, 19. Well, you were live and you were watching TV. Yeah, 1960-ish. <laughs> and did he have to go down to LA? Yeah. Wow. And we had stayed with the Johnsons, their friends. What? I have an ancestry question. What's that? When you're going through through lines and some people are marked as... Here. Part of a DNA circle. What, does uh -huh. that mean? what is that? Yeah. So I, it's been a while since I've done that, but where they, they connect, it's almost like shared matches in a way. But like everybody in this person and this person seem to match, and this person and this person seem to match and these two people seem to so it's match. not just you dna matching to somebody who has it on there but it's multiple people that match which makes it a more a probable yeah okay yeah they don't necessarily match each other right but parts of it match you know this yeah. group matches and one of these matches and huh. it's been a while since i've looked at that to be honest yeah it's um, just weird that just some of them you know because i have a lot of matches on on through lines but only some of them have the that um i think you have to have like three or four or something okay to make, I, I i'd have to look at that again terribly i'd be happy to but i just pat has more of that than i do well no i probably do because of the print what's the question about through lines what it, it's a, when it says part of a dna circle they don't seem to emphasize that as much as they used to. Let me see. Let me look doing. at that again, Tamberly, because I it's been a long time since I've looked yeah. at that. I'm trying huh. to see who that was that yeah. it must be must be something that's more than just one ops or something. Yeah. Now I can't find it. And it's pretty far down, which makes sense because you're, 
you know, there's more there. Yeah, yes. like one of them, this is my fourth great grandmother. I have 34 matches, uh -huh. and then, but she's also marked as a DNA circle. Meaning there's lots of people that match somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Or that then match each other that also match her or something. Something. I yeah. That. It, it, I that. Honestly, I, it's, let's see, we look under DNA through lines. Is that where it is? Is under through lines? Yeah. You have to find somebody in your through line that has that marker. That has that marker. Do you okay. go to your DNA? A general search have. question bucket. It, you go to the DNA tabs, and one of the tabs is um, uh, through lines. Maybe right, but there's, there's no place where I can search DNA circle as a term on. Yeah, it used to come up a whole bunch. So where did you find it in the one you were, you found it? How did you? Well, when I went, when I go to my through lines and I scroll down. Yeah. Like on my, one of my fourth great grandmothers. Yeah. It says, whose name is Rhoda Dyer, Rhoda Dyer DNA circle in blue. Oh, but, then, but then I can't find anything. Where's, where's that image on the Can you share on my, Kimberly? Because I don't, I don't see what you're looking at. So know. when you go to through lines and you've got all your people, right? First great grandparents, second great. Yeah, I'm there. So, and you might not have one, but I as, you, lines, as you scroll over the people, like I've got one person one fourth great grandmother that's then marked with this blue DNA circle. Oh, okay. So I'm looking for a blue. I'm looking at Pat's because I know he had it before. I don't see any third line. And I can't. Online. I can't find even a general search button on Ancestry that lets me search for the word DNA circle. They don't oh. have that. They have hmm. like facts, but not. I can't type in DNA. Maybe if I just go out to Google and type in DNA circle. Try YouTube. Do. That's usually answers everything. What? <laughs> There's something I'm looking for it. Yeah. I'm going to the help screen. But this is frustrating that Ancestry doesn't have a. It does have a search. Okay. What's it called? DNA circles. Oops. Okay. DNA circles, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you sure that's the verbiage they use, DNA circles? Yes, that's what it says. DNA circles. All right. Waiting for DNA results. Okay, just a minute. Oh, here, I just go. It says it's a set of likely descendants of a given ancestry. Ancestor and is generated by combining. Uh, they're calling it communities now, I think. Ancestry DNA communities. Circles are based on your DNA, the regions with circles and dotted lines and without purpose. Okay. To a tree. Huh. But you because have that little image, huh? This say it's a set of likely descendants of a given ancestor and is generated by combining pedigree and IBD information across the entire ancestry DNA database. What's IBD? But how, I mean, that's how all of those through lines are done. Right. Huh. I don't know what IBD is. Yeah, I'm not, I, what is it, IB what? IBD. I don't know. I, I don't even under the search results for DNA circles on ancestries search. It doesn't say, um, except for this one, circles are based on your DNA, the region with circles and dotted lines and without percentages but they call it communities. So it's your access to your results. I don't know, like I said, I haven't seen much about it lately, but huh. let's go looking at communities. All right, status. View your communities, click the DNA tab and, collect, and select DNA story. 
The regions with solid circles are based on your DNA. The regions with circle. No, that's different. That's different. I don't know, uh, Tamara. Hmm. So what do you guys want to do next time? <laughs> I don't want to do that. Before. I don't know. Um, I want to work really hard on my Kilgallen. So you're so close. I know. Should we take next week off? No, I don't. I just I don't want to prepare something else personally. Well, that's why I was saying Tamberly and Derby might. Yeah, maybe. Just saying. Just saying. Yeah. Um, or we could just see. We could all show up and do our. Have, See what come up. Yeah, yeah. maybe in, instead of preparing something, I'll dedicate the time that would have been preparing to actually digging it further into some dead end. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, missing, I'm missing six of 32 third grade grandparents. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, so, yeah, I, uh, I've got all my second grades. I've got 28 okay. of the 32 third grades and half of the fourth grades. There you go. That's good. Just getting you, really inspired to, to come back and do it is is a positive to and you could and 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 then you can present it to us and we could maybe offer suggestions for what to do next. Yeah, maybe go after the elusive Irish people. Oh, I like Irish Irish people. immigrants. Those are the Look ones. At them at the end have. of the rainbow. Yeah, I got lots of Irish resources I could pull up well, you know, spontaneously. And look for things. And Deirdre, do you have something like that too, maybe? Um, yeah, I would like to just keep looking. And like I, my mom, I'm like, mom, why is your grandfather who died in Monterey County, you have no birth or death date for him. I'm like, this is the easiest, most verifiable right. you know, thing. And you don't even have it on your tree. Uh, yeah, I... <laughs> So Derek, we go down to the county and get it. I don't know if I have to go down to the county and get it. My mom has it. It just needs to be put on. She probably thought it was something she, she knew so well that it wasn't needing to be. No, I mean, my mom doesn't do the ancestry stuff. My dad does. But, and I told him today, I'm like, dad, you have this, just put it on, you know, but I mean, I could put it on there for her too. But yeah, I feel like I should be like, I really should focus, I pay. Twelve ninety five a month for that French oh. theology page, and I have not like furthered that. No, I probably really should focus on just looking at the genealogy stuff. You know. Yeah, I mean, when you get to a kind of a dead end on something, work on something else, so that a you feel like accomplishment, and b you're waiting yeah. for something else to present itself. You know, another database. Right. Online you get better something. at something, and you can yeah. turn around and use it on. Something else. One of the things yeah. I did is I made a new category on ancestry for tuberculosis. And I think I might do that with some of the other terms and stuff too, just to kind of see as I go through, if I could find their death certificates or whatever, what they died of. Maybe I'll, I'm making, I'm trying to group them more so that maybe, I don't know, that I can see more about my family's life and stuff. Maybe, you know, yeah. even whatever it is, just topics of different filters I'm making. Like I've been doing military service and then when I'll put, I'll put military service and then I'll put the war, like I'll put World yeah. War II Revolution or Civil War or whatever. And then see if, cause I also have fold three and I haven't even opened that. Yeah. And there, it's sort of a mixed bag. So Re Revolutionary war, it's got tons of stuff, but some of the other boards it doesn't. So, you know. Right. So my so I shared with Caspi, and one of the few things that got, got their interest is I showed him the, the Revolutionary War guy. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why we know of him is because in 1937, the graveyard, I guess he's at in Virginia, I think it's Virginia, yeah, Virginia, went and was trying to put headstones on everything that was missing headstones. Oh, so they, uh, they created a form saying, this is the guy, he's here. And then it gave a little information about when he enlisted and what regiment he was in and mm -hmm. what his, his title was, you know, what, what ranking. And so I sent it to Caspian. He thought that was interesting. Military history he loves. So he looked at it, he goes, 
mom, that's not a second lieutenant. He couldn't have been a second lieutenant. That didn't exist in those days. I'm going, oh, he goes, they probably oh. evaluated him and said that, that he was what he would have been is the second lieutenant if that had existed. So, so they made it, uh -huh. they added the rank to him, even though it didn't happen. And I said, uh -huh. well, if this is the right guy, he would have been older because just judging, I don't know what year he was born, but judging on how old his daughters and his children were, he would have been probably, his kids were like teenagers or in their twenties. And Cass said that since he was a second lieutenant, he probably had money. He probably had a horse. He could ride. And he was a man of prestige or whatever. So they would have given him a higher rank. So, it, and he would have been in his fifties, maybe early fifties. So Caspian said it made total sense that he would have been um, an officer in the Revolutionary War. And I, I wouldn't have thought, because I would have thought, you know, maybe somebody in their thirties, but not somebody in their fifties, but Cass said that's, that was likely. So I didn't know any of that, but it made him actually show some interest <laughs> for, for 15 minutes, but and I learned something. So, right. Well, like I want to put the story about my great grandfather that, you know, didn't die in World War One because his skin was so white. You know, I yeah, want to that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's so so we'll come back week. with something next week. Yeah. So Tamberly and Deirdre are going to come back with something of interest to them. Mary, do you want to be part of something of interest to you next week? Well, she did something today. Uh, that's yeah, right. I'm, I'm also going to keep on going in my direction of um, this sister and just try to find more information. Like I wasn't on Family Search for a while, um, oh. and it's revamped. Though. There's a lot. I don't know. I like the navigation of it a lot better, and uh, just going to keep on going. If I have any news, then I'll share that. That is really interesting that they came over together and then they just gone. Yeah, I have no. Might have had jobs lined up in service somewhere if they were poor. That's what I think. Because yeah, yeah, she, was, yeah, she, she could have married. she could have married and had you know changed her name and kind of disappeared. And she told me they ate meat with maggots in it. Oh, because they didn't know any better and they used to wipe their butts with straw. Ooh. Like, and she came over on the ship. Like, it was like that. That was rough. Rough. I think she was orphaned. I don't. I don't know. Like the whole. I don't know. This is your grandmother. Or at least, that? or at least, putting care of a family member because there was a lot of Andrusovitz in the in the town where she came from. I just cannot find her baptismal. I can't find any death records. No, nothing. You know, it's it's sad, especially with women that they could have disappeared. And, you know, we have resources now to be able to find somebody for if somebody's been missing, at least we could stalk them on Facebook and, or someplace and see if we could find them or find something. But in in those days, even 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, how would you know? You know, here's here's a really quick story. This is um, a sad one. My ex mother in law had a sister who lived up in the Oregon area or Washington area and she was estranged from the family because her husband was real abusive and they lost you know got broken contact and then she kind of got word that her sister died but never heard anything else but they all knew he killed her I think he I think he had been um you know there's a lot of abuse and they knew that there was something going on but I asked my mother-in-law and I said well, how are you allowing this to happen? Don't you know what happened to your sister? Don't you want to know? Or don't you want to go find out if she's still alive or dead? She goes, nope, nobody wants to know. They're afraid that the guy will come back and harm them or whatever. And I thought, I thought that was really strange that you would allow your sister, you know, your sister would disappear from you. Probably not because she was mad at you, but because uh, somebody had controlled her in that way and that you didn't know if she's living or dead. And you didn't want to go find out, you know, it seems like that'd be a natural thing to do is contact your brother-in-law and say, Hey, you know, I haven't heard from my wife, my sister in years. Can you tell me where she is? 
Well, yeah. they didn't like her, pal. I mean, and they didn't want to know. They didn't want to. They didn't want to go there because they figured she was probably dead. The rumor was she was dead, and he had killed her. Just amazing how these women can just disappear like that. Okay, it is on that lovely easy. note. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> Please it's watch five after four. It's not a great because of kittens and puppies, and maybe you'll feel better. I watched it. <laughs> we had a conference this last weekend. We had a conference, and I was super busy, so I was really glad that last week we didn't meet because I was really busy. But we had um, a lot of really fantastic talks. Talks. One was on um, uh, a woman I know who's who's working on research on um, uh, uh, what is that disease? Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. uh she was she was a get a really interesting talk on you know that approval that drug that just came out that they were using yes. yes. it was a fantastic talk on it it's freaking horrible that is definitely not working there's no oh. efficacy in that at all and it's like twenty five thousand dollars or more a year to pay and there's no results no results so so we were all like really depressed watching it and then we also had a talk by Paul Offit who's the um uh, works with Fauci and deciding all this stuff about, you know, the, the, the COVID and stuff. Yeah. And so he was talking, he says on Tuesday, we're going to be talking about, we're going to, we're going to sit down and really have a good talk about if we're going to prove this for kids. And so here Tuesday comes out and there's the announcement and we're like, Ooh, I know that guy, but it was, a, but it was all depressing. You know, a lot of it was depressing. So all weekend we're like, and so, uh, you know, on chat, I'm sharing videos of kittens to people. <laughs> I'm not kidding. There was one talk I watched and there was kittens and puppies jumping and, ling and rolling on top of each other and having a good time as the person's talking about, well, it's all bad news. <laughs> well, I have a question for Tamberly though. Um, and somehow, Susan, you knew this terminology. Your grandmother that her hand would write with somebody else's oh, yeah. automatic writing. What yeah. it, like Tamberly needs to go to bed now because she's very tired. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amberly has not been doing her share of cleaning the house. Yes. Was that <laughs> <her> <laughs> great? They're not doing well. Tamberly. She's spending too much time in the closet with the box carbon. <laughs> <for eating. laughs> you gotta be quick. You gotta be really quick. That's the best story. Tamberly. Oh, and, and if you if you want me to someday, I will tell you the story of the Manson killings and automatic writing by from one of the neighbors. Um, true story. <laughs> another time, Susan. Yeah, another time. Okay. But remind me, and I'll tell it. See you. So, and Deirdre, good luck on your refrigerator doors. Now yeah, that he's not here yet, Kimberly, I'm going to call you in a minute after after this. Okay. Okay. I'll ask you something. We, we have the Halloween plan too. So, yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. Bye bye. All right, All right everybody. everybody. Good meeting.